Hello and welcome to the Siphon and Credibility Podcast. We have uh, the two hosts, Jacob and Michael, and a guest, if you'd like to uh, introduce yourself. And... I'm also Michael, M- Michael Johnston. I'm the Associate Dean of Education, or one of the three Associate Deans of Education in the Faculty of Education at uh, Victoria University. Cool. And you, um, and you wanted to get some talk about free speech a little bit. Um, so how are, you, yeah. how are you related to that, uh, that sort of field? Well, I'm, a, I'm an academic, and uh, to me, the heart and soul of the academy is about not only defending free speech, but actually practicing it. It's, to me, it's, it, it's a principle, but it's more than a principle. It's a process by which we work out ideas. Mm-hmm. And so whether we're scientists or historians or classical scholars, whatever we may be, we're trying to approximate truth. We're trying to move towards truth. And to do that, we have to test our ideas. And the only way we can test our ideas is by contesting them against one another. By talking to you, I, I can find out where I'm wrong. Um, and you can do the same. We can sometimes have ideas that neither one of us would have had alone. Uh, in an environment where people are scared to say things because they're frightened of offending others or they're frightened that, you know, in the worst case scenario of being arrested, uh, that, that process is, is very stymied. Yeah, and I think we can all agree that in a very overarching sense, free speech is sort of like what we're after, what we want. But a lot of what we kind of want to discuss today is more the limitations that are put on free speech and whether yes. you know they're justified or not because yep. it becomes a lot more nuanced you know if you're just in an educational field you know and you just want to know if you know one plus one equals two there's no you know there's no debate there you know it's fact and so it's very easy to say what should be like it should be you should be able to say that right sure so it's the it's the controversial things that matter. exactly they're, they're, and it's and yeah. it's the controversial things that people find it controversial if you say so yeah a lot of what we're going to be discussing today is around like the limits of free speech and also how free speech is sort of changed over time as well, mm-hmm. you know. Um, mm-hmm. In real life, everything's not really black and white. So there's a lot of a grey area where yeah. you might say, this isn't necessarily what should happen. Yeah. That's absolutely right. And that's, and that's, what, we're, that's yeah. what we mostly want to discuss today, because I think even people who would consider themselves anti-free speech in a general sense actually agree on academic free speech a lot of the time if it's in a non-controver- non-controversial uh, field. But, yeah, that, that to me isn't really defending no, no, free speech. No, absolutely not. And, um, and, and as far as the limitations are concerned, we can probably agree as well that there need to be some, and we have some enshrined in the law, in my view, appropriately. So threats of violence uh, ought to be out of bounds because that that is an attempt to coerce others, and that, that to me is not uh, free speech. That's not contesting ideas. That That's just uh, threatening. Yeah. Uh, and similarly, slandering people and, and, and Destroying their reputations in a personal sense, that, that ought to be out of bounds, and it is. You can sue people for doing that, and, and that seems to me the right redress for that. Um, and within that, you know, those are legislated things, and then there are other layers, right? So take a university, for example. Personally, uh, my view is that any idea should be fair game in a university. People might be offended or, or scared or whatever. That, too bad. That's where you have it out. But I think it's reasonable to have some rules in a university about how the discourse takes place and, mm-hmm. and uh, to make sure that opposing ideas can also be put up and, 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 and that, that people ju- don't just get to insult others gratuitously. Mm-hmm. So I think mm-hmm. you're right, it's not black and white. There's many layers to this. Yeah, the discourse should be framed in a constructive manner. It shouldn't just be a screaming contest. Well, that's not productive, is it? And, and so while... A screaming contest should not be illegal. Mm. It's perfectly reasonable to, for an organisation like a university to say that's not how we conduct our discourse here. But it does yeah. sort of lead to a kind of an interesting uh, idea, though, which is that universities in New Zealand, at least, are partially publicly funded. So when a university does shut down free speech, and I put that in air quotes because um, you know perhaps that's not like a screaming contest is technically in the most technical sense free speech, but it's not very productive. Mm. But when a university does shut that down. It is, in a very tangential sense, a government shutting down free speech because the university is partially publicly funded. So it leads you into a bit of a grey area there. What do you What do you think? Uh, the university is partially pu- publicly funded. Uh, it's, to me, that's not really the issue because I look at universities as being cultural institutions rather than state institutions as such. It is true that to an extent they are state institutions, but to the degree that they're venues for discussion of ideas, they're cultural institutions. And 
again, we're talking about rules about how discourse is conducted, not about legal sanction. So mm. nobody is going to be arrested for a screaming match on campus. Uh, if they were, that would be an impingement of, of civil liberties, an unacceptable one in, in my view. But they may, it might be reasonable to say, well, you're not playing by the rules of the game that we have set up in this cultural institution. And, 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 so, and so it does come down to actually what people believe. And that, that I think is possibly, once you take that on board, if you really understand that this is something about values rather than law or rather than hard and fast rules, you can start to unpick some of the apparent contradictions or paradoxes in, the, in this debate. Okay, so if we end up with a society in which people don't value free speech, well then democracy is over. Mm. That's just a statement of what, what I would see as a statement of fact. It's not um, something that you can say, here's how we'd stop that happening. Or, And in the end, to me, the way to protect these values is to take personal responsibility for them. Now that may not be enough because if you're the only one doing that, then <laughs> you're not going to win. But if enough people do, then we can save democratic society. So when you say take personal responsibility for it, do you mean um, like what do you mean by that? Do you mean like personally fight for free speech or support it in an obvious manner? Yeah. Or yeah, I mean I think it means several things. I think it it means thinking through carefully what you value in a society and the kind of society you want to live in and what will be required to maintain that sort of society <clears throat> and then to practice those values yourself mm. and that to me is the key to just about everything worth doing rather than trying to change other people mm. to focus on yourself what can i do because that's the realm of control that's where you can actually have some real effect and where nobody else can really you know i mean short of killing you or harming you, uh, stop you doing that. So, mm. yes, per personal responsibility. And then what that also entails is trying to mitigate the downside of those values, because every set of values has a downside. And I, I think it's perfectly fair for, to point out that, well, oh, hate speech is a thing. I, I don't think it should be illegal, but I think it's a thing, and I think it's offensive, and I think it's undesirable. Um, and so if I hear somebody expressing... Uh, a prejudiced attitude against a category of people or insulting somebody un uh, gratuitously, then part of that personal responsibility for free speech is to speak up and say, I think you're wrong, and, and I think that's offensive. And, I, and I, I, So it doesn't mean shutting the other person down or trying to have them arrested or telling them they, they're not allowed to say what they've got to say, but rather pointing out why you think they're wrong and perhaps defending the person that's being attacked or whatever. Exactly. Mm. I feel like a common problem in this debate is that some people think that allowing people to speak their mind, whether it's offensive or not, is construed as accepting their beliefs, but it's just enabling them to speak what they will, whether you believe it or not. So simply just allowing them to do so doesn't necessarily mean you agree with them. Well, be completely opposite. I think you, you put your finger on an important thing there. That's right. And it's one of the things that seems to come across in a lot of, from a lot of the people who are proponents of things like hate speech laws. And, and, and so actually we've got to a point where even a conversation like this might be construed as hate speech by some. Um, if we're saying we think that people should be allowed to say hateful things, they will, as you say, somehow take that as us agreeing with those hateful things rather than just saying no. Unfortunately, that's a cost of having a, a, an emancipated society in which people are able to freely express what they think. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. What you say there about people misconstruing freedom of speech as supporting that speech. Um, even when we were planning out this podcast, we're like, what you know, what should we discuss? And there were a few things where we're like, we could talk about this, but actually, we don't want any one of the three of us to have that, you know, sound like clipped out of context, you know, five years yeah, from now yes. when, we, <laughs> when we're doing something totally different, right? You know, and you say something like, I support this sort of bigotry or whatever, right? If, where you forgot that the whole the person cut out the whole sentence was actually, I support this sort of bigotry, being able to speak, right, you know. Yes, yeah. um, and so there are some things now where I think we have a kind of a modern culture where we try and, uh, like, particularly on social media, where we try and, like, shut people down, you know, um, like, for what, for what they're saying, we try and clip... Um, you know, clip things to make people look really bad. Do you think that that's a threat to freedom of speech overall? Or 
I think is that something we should be worried about? It's very dishonest, um, and it does happen. And it, it's happened for a, a long time, actually. I mean, I mean, television interviews and so on get edited, and that's been going on for decades. So it's not new that people can be taken out of context and misrepresented in that sort of way. Mm. Um, and, and yes, it's inimical to proper debate and proper exchange of ideas, and, it, and it's a dishonest tactic to discredit people. Um, should it be illegal? Prob probably not. Again, mm -hmm. it's, it's one of the costs of the cut and thrust of a, of a, of a free society, but it should be called out. And um, yeah. if, it, if, it, if it happens, then people should definitely complain about it and speak up about it. Mm. Yeah, and that's definitely one of the strengths of, free, of having free speech is that if your free speech is used against you, you are at least able to pipe up yes. about it, you know? Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, one of the things we wanted to discuss specifically with this podcast is in our kind of current climate where we see, at least personally, a lot of um, what I would say is shutting down of freedom of speech, right? I know that you co-signed an article about um, the shutting down of certain people who wanted to speak in New Zealand. Um, yeah. And we wondered if you thought that's part of sort of a greater trend towards people um, supporting free speech less? Or, like, are we going in the wrong direction, do you think? I, th I think the Western world is going in the wrong direction. Uh, possibly the worst of it is actually happening, happening in the UK at the moment. I I've been reading about the police ringing people up and telling them that they haven't committed a crime, but they've tweeted something or said something off-colour in social media, and they should check their thinking. Mm. Now, my response be, to that would be, what are you, the thought police now, you yeah. know, because that, that is exactly what they're doing. And while they're not threatening to arrest the person, they're very clear, this wasn't a crime. Having the cops ring you up and, and, and take you to task for saying something, well, it's intimidating to say the least. And, and they're agents of the state and that, whoa, you know, that, that's not a, a good direction to go. We're not doing anything like that here yet and let's yet. hope we never do. Um, there, there are some clouds on the horizon in New Zealand. I think the, the incidents at Massey where uh, Don Brash was banned from speaking on campus last year and when Megan Murphy, the radical feminist, was banned from speaking this year. Uh, well, Massey has no right to call itself a university. It's going to do things like that for one thing. And it's obviously a, an illiberal and, in my view, deeply wrong thing to do. But no other university has done anything quite like that yet. And, um, you know, here's hoping they don't. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you know anything about sort of the context of why those people weren't able to speak? Like what uh, justification yeah. was used? Were uh, they obvious about it or was it more sort of like subtle other justification? Well, in the case of Don Brash, the initial reason given was that there were some security concerns. And we can talk about that because that that's acceding to a thug's veto. Uh, and while, you know, university authorities do have to take responsibility for security on campus, in my view, they should do a great deal to enable invited speakers to speak if there's a genuine threat to security. Um, but it turned out that it wasn't really that at all. And there were some leaked emails from Jan Thomas, the vice chancellor, that showed that she was clearly looking for an excuse to to, mm. to keep him out because he's the um, the the leader of Hobson's Pledge. He, he he opposes separate political representation for Māori, which she sees as you know borderline hate speech or something <laughs> along those lines. She said, and, and which it, it clearly isn't. It's clearly a legitimate area for debate. Yeah, um, whether you uh, agree or disagree. Well. On that particular issue, I, I disagree with him, but absolutely I support his right to debate it on, on the campus. And in the case of Megan Murphy, um, she's been held to be a, a trans-exclusionary radical feminist, a TERF, for saying that biological men ought not be able to be in women's sporting events or go in women's toilets and the like. And uh, I agree with her about that, but again, you know, other people can legitimately disagree, but it's a topic that ought to be mm -hmm. able to be debated. And, and in both of those cases, there is no attack on an individual, and there's no attack on a category either, actually. I mean, some of the, the trans activists might disagree and say, actually, she is attacking trans people, and, but again, that ought to be a matter for debate, and I could argue with them about that, and we'd each have a point of view, and we could have it out if, if we were allowed to actually have that conversation. Yeah, and it's not, and I think it's it's almost bigger than that as well, because it's not just that you're allowed to have a conversation. It's also that you need to be allowed to have a conversation on a platform, you know, so people can 
Because if you have a debate, you know, with uh, one person who disagrees with you, you might convince them, they might convince you. But if you can have that debate in front of a university, of you course. know, like 500 people there and maybe another, you know, a few thousand on YouTube or whatever. <laughs> but if you get shut down from that, then it's not just the effect that that had on you specifically, but it's all those people you may have convinced or you may have said something really dumb. And, you know, they'd be like, okay, no, this guy's, like, even worse than I thought, right? <laughs> That's right, yeah. But, um, Give them enough rope to hang themselves and all ex- that. Ex- yeah. Exactly, <laughs> but, but, but you, you know, you never really get, um, you never get that opportunity because some chance, vice-chancellor at some university has instead decided, you know, that that's, you know... On their own whim. Yeah. And, and you're quite right. The first point you make is excellent, uh, um, that you're actually depriving public discourse of an opportunity to think, think through an idea, you know, uh, and... I've seen that done so well. I, I don't know if you guys saw any of the debates between Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson. Um, I thought they were object lessons and how you have a proper discussion about difficult mm. ideas between people who have profound disagreements and yet they treat one another, well, to use an old fashioned word, like gentlemen. They, mm. they, they talk in a civil way, they respect one another's positions, they don't try to mischaracterise one another, they make genuine attempts to really get their head around what the other person is saying. And even if they don't change their point of view, they at least sharpen their own thinking and find where there are weak areas in what they're saying and, and learn some appreciation for what the other person is saying. And that to me is, yeah. To be honest, I, I, I'm appalled that we're at this cultural moment where we even have to talk about this, but we clearly do. <laughs> yeah. You know, now the question is, how did we get to this stage? Yeah. How, how, did, how did it come to be that you have to describe gentlemanly discourse as being old-fashioned? Yeah, yep. like, you've got me there. <laughs> the past, like, 20 or so yeah. years, there's just been a massive cultural shift away from values that would be considered commonplace, mm. you know, generations ago. Yep. So, how did this actually occur? Because mm. from... An outside perspective, not having looked into this, this seems rather sudden. It seems like they've managed to reach positions of authority and are able to drastically influence discourse. Mm. But it seems like this has sprung up out of nowhere. Like, what would be the roots for this? It's a very, very good question. And I have no definitive answers, but I I do have some speculations. Mm. So, first of all, your observation that it's seems to have sprung up very quickly, I think is accurate. I'm not sure that it has sprung up very quickly. I think things get to a critical point and then there's a sudden change. But I think, as you say, there are roots that go back a lot further. So part of it is what you might call a certain cultural exhaustion or or just the the fact that, you know, we've had democracy for a long time now, you know, in this country, universal democracy for about 150 years all all adults have been able to vote for about that long Um, and you know different countries have different histories of that but the west is every just about every western country has had full adult suffrage for for at least a century and that's several generations and so nobody remembers or even knows anybody who remembers what it was like for it not to be that way so it becomes taken for granted well that makes it vulnerable straight away. Another thing is that I think, tragically, we've forgotten some of the terrible lessons of the 20th century. You know, I was born 20 years after, 22 years after the end of World War Two, and so when I grew up at, at, and and I was at primary school even, there there were teachers who were absolutely determined to expose us to the dangers of totalitarianism and what that would be like. So we, we learned all about the Holocaust. I learned about that at a frighteningly young age and, and the, th- the sorts of things that can lead to it. Not so much the, uh, the disaster of the Soviet Union, that, that, that was still in train when I was a child, but, but it, you know, it was starting to loom large as something that you wanted to avoid as well. And now, you know, probably more than half of the population is is too young to really remember even the fall of the wall, let alone what led to Nazism in Germany in the 30s. Um, so, so I think that's one thing. Maybe another is an erosion of the idea of truth itself, the idea that you can have a reasoned path to something real. Um, 
and that that one might lay at the feet of postmodernism and that, and that kind of discourse which has taken root in especially the humanities faculties of universities um, with some some notable dissenters uh, but but nonetheless it's it's pretty prevalent and, and and see that's not a good basis on which to be able to talk about values because if, if there's no if you can't ground values in anything then anything is as good as anything else ultimately and so how can you say that you know a liberal society is better than a totalitarian one or or even understand what the difference is properly um, that might be another thing. I think Jonathan Haidt has some interesting insights. Are you aware of him? He's a he's a social psychologist from America, and and um, he's done a lot of work trying to understand why there's a, a bit of an ec epidemic of anxiety and depression in, in young people, um, and there is. I mean, the, the data are very clear. And he wrote a book called The Coddling of the American Mind, which I, I thoroughly recommend having a read of. You guys would enjoy it immensely, I think. And one of the sources he puts down to what we might call helicopter parenting, so parents who are protecting their children against all risk, um, which does not lead them, doesn't result in them growing up to be resilient people at all. Um, he uses the term anti-fragile. I'm not sure if he coined that term. I think somebody else did, but I like the term. So we can think, well, what's it, what's something fragile? You know, a, a carp is fragile. If you hit it with a hammer, it shatters. Um, other things are resilient or resistant. If you if you hit a rubber ball with a hammer, the hammer bounces off. But anti-fragile things improve under stress. Your immune system is an example of that. And, and so, as Haidt says, our children and people in general. So if we expose ourselves in a, in a voluntary and controlled way to risk and, and even threat and challenge and all of that, we actually get stronger. We get more able to cope with that kind of thing. And so his view is that by protecting children too much when they're young, they don't develop the, that sort of resilience. And it's a, it's a resilience with ideas as well as physical situations. In fact, it's probably more with ideas than <coughs> with physical situations. So in a free speech context, for example, some, <coughs> someone who's been raised in, you know, like helicopter parents are always protected from negative ideas, right? Yeah, are you saying that, you know, they see some, you know, something they disagree with on Twitter and instead of wanting to engage with it, right, they just don't even want to deal with it, they want to band and gone. It's precisely it. Yeah. So when I was at university, I remember this quite well because it was <coughs> a kind of strange thing. There was a, um, a creation scientist, an American fundamentalist Christian who came to the campus to talk about how God had created the world in seven days about two and a half thousand years ago or something along those lines. And as a, a scientist, of course, I, I saw this as a, a fairly ridiculous thing to argue, but it would not in a million years have occurred to me to try to have him banned from coming to the campus and saying these things. Instead, I was right there <laughs> in the talk, right up the front, and you know, as soon as he'd finished my hand up, like <laughs> with a whole lot of stuff to argue with him about, and so. You know, I was raring to get at this this difficult idea, far from being, you know, offended or or, or thinking that he should be shut down. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, I think at the first point you raised um, about like sort of like a reverse cultural zeitgeist, you know, where like you know culture's been going one way for so long, but everyone forgot what it was like, you know, when it was the other way, right? I think that's a really interesting idea, and I think that's actually evidenced by because we were doing some research for this podcast, right? And we were, and, you know, we sort of agreed with your idea that, you know, in the West, um, free speech seems to have been being eroded. But then, you know, we came to the conclusion, it's like, but what about in the rest of the world? And we were looking at, like, you know, post-Soviet Europe and stuff, free speech is, you know, totally, totally reversed, right? And so we were, and I think that makes a lot of sense of what you were saying, which is that if you had recently experienced what it was like to not have free speech, and other freedoms as well, but, you know, free speech is sort of, like, what, what that's like, then you're going to be very dogged at protecting it and, um you know, uh, trying to, you know, keep things how they are, because you know what it was like, you know, when they weren't like that. And so I think that like, your point is definitely proven by these states, which used to be under, you know, a totalitarian or authoritarian regime and are now no longer, you know. Yeah, I think you're probably right. I don't, I don't know enough about it to comment extensively. I, I have question marks about countries like Russia. Uh, they're not obviously as totalitarian as they were, as it was in the Soviet era when people were called off to gulags and the, and the like. Um, as far as I know, they don't 
do that anymore. Although there seems to have been Maybe possibly just more some. Subtle. Yeah, well, you know, there, there's been people dying in mysterious circumstances, journalists and the like, seeming, seemingly poisoned by shady characters. So the the stuff that goes on there that we wouldn't like to see go on here, I'm sure, or, or like to see go on anywhere. And, and one might have question marks about how free the media is in Russia. Or one might have some questions about that in the West as well now. But um, so I think, I, and, and I guess the other thing about that is that it takes time to develop the institutions of democracy. Um, it's kind of interesting, I, you know, this is a little theory that I've had, and I'm not historian enough to really examine its validity, but you guys are sort of historians, aren't you? Maybe you can have some, some thoughts about this. If you, if you take England, for example, I think it's until very recently, an object lesson in how you develop liberal values. So. And the answer, is, the answer is slowly and carefully over time. So starting with Magna Carta and moving from there, mm -hmm. they gradually eroded the power of the crown and increased the power of the, the people, as it were. Um, they got their civil war out of the way fairly early, and it was fairly brief. And, uh, and after that, they, they never had anything like that again. And they developed the common law system, which seems to be a remarkable way of doing business legally. Uh, the institutions of the British Parliament and so on, and and now they've got this this strange system where they're a monarchy, but the monarch has no actual real power. She's a figurehead, and and everybody votes, and they have elections, and and everything seems to work pretty well. And they got to that point with not completely without violence, but in a reasonably peaceful sort of way. And compare that with France, where. They had a much bloodier revolution a century or so later than the, yeah, the English Civil five, War. Three or four revolutions as well. And more revolutions after enough. that. That's right. Um, but they still kind of got there, and now they're a pretty functional democracy and, and all of that. And then you can move right across Europe to, to Russia, where they went straight from feudalism to totalitarian communism almost overnight. And then straight to uh, democracy. Well, um, sort of democracy, but that's quotes, the thing. Some... So the democracy isn't, hasn't got very deep roots there, because they haven't got the institutions, it seems to me, to really... And the, and the deep cultural values that take that time to develop. And I think that's a really interesting point, with the idea that if you try and do democracy instantly, it maybe doesn't work as well as you think it does, because... No. Putin specifically, even like not even talking about totalitarian or authoritarianism in Russia in general, but Putin specifically was able to take um, take over a lot of the institutions almost immediately after you know after transition, everyone's like settling into a democracy, and then suddenly you've got a strong man again. And what well, the most interesting thing is that even if you find unbiased figures for Putin's approval rate, they're actually really high because right. culturally the Russians never shifted. Yep. Right. I think that's a really astute point. Um. So yep. if it had some time, right? You know a bit of a more gradual process but culturally they're still you know they were um you know full feudal feudal monarchy straight to you know totalitarian still strong man politics although party politics this time and now you go straight to democracy but you actually you never culture so you still think to yourself oh your strong man leader is good you know even if but what i find interesting and what i can't explain is that both um the feudal monarchy and the totalitarian strong man state None of them actually served the Russian people very well at all. So I kind of no. actually, you would think um, at a cultural level that that might cause a shift, but I guess you'd be wrong. I think that we haven't examined enough the the sort of psychological and, and sociological ground on which democracy has to grow. Um, it's not so straightforward as just to say, well, this way of life would be better, let's adopt it. Mm. There's a lot of counterintuitive stuff in there. It's where... Did you guys have a look at the article I wrote with James on Popper, on Karl Popper? No. So, there's so. A, um, we wrote this thing on the spin-off about, about Karl Popper, who was a, I knew most as a philosopher of science, but James has read his political philosophy, and, and it, there's an interesting correspondence be, between, not surprisingly, he's the same guy, between <laughs> those, those, those two philosophies. So, in science, we have this principle that he developed called falsificationism. And falsificationism is, is the idea that when you have a theory, what you do as a good scientist is to set out to disprove it. Which is, I just love that. I think it's one of the greatest ideas in history because it's so counterintuitive and it's so honest. Yeah, it's absolutely. Like, if my idea is really strong, then it will withstand my best efforts to destroy it. And, and 
it flies in the face of all sorts of psychological propensities that we have to confirm our existing ideas. Confirmation bias, peer group conformity, obedience to authority. All of those forces which come to bear on us as individuals, we can counteract by adopting this falsificationist principle. But you have to be trained to use it. It's not, it's not at all easy. And even good scientists don't do it all the time. You know, it's, you've got to constantly concentrate on it, even in the in the practice of science, let alone in, in other parts of one's life. And I think the principles of liberal democracy are a bit like that as well. The idea that we ought to resist authority, that we ought to resist ideas just because they're popular. And, and I think there's a kind of gravitation that takes us back towards that more natural, hierarchical and authoritarian way of being. I, I think human beings evolved in fairly authoritarian structures, probably, even though, you know, they may have, may have been fairly flat in the Stone Age because people didn't live together in that large groups. You, you'd have, you know, tough guys who'd, who'd rule the roost, probably. Um, and that, that sort of thinking translated into more technological societies becomes totalitarianism. Uh, democracy, that's something else. That, that requires a bit of an enlightenment or a bit of insight into the, the very idea of liberty. It's not a very old idea. <laughs> and it, it, it's easy to forget that because, it, well, it was, it did come into being well before living memory. So people just get the idea that it's always been there. But but it hasn't, and not every culture's had it. So, you know, for example, when Saddam Hussein was taken out in, in Iraq, well, now they have elections, but I wouldn't really say they've got democracy. No. Likewise, likewise Libya, I mean, you, you take out the strongman, you leave power vacuum, you don't, you don't leave a well-functioning civil society. Yeah, and I think that's a really interesting issue that, um, that almost has to be tackled, because every, or most Western states a big part of their foreign policy is the spreading of democracy, whether it's, you know, overt, like uh, the United States, spreading of spreading of US influence, perhaps is a better way to put that, or whether it's more just like what they, what the stated aim, like New Zealand's foreign policy, our stated aim is to spread democracy and stabilisation in the Pacific. Whether we put a lot of effort into achieve that is another, mm. another idea, but it's a really interesting, you've got to answer that question first before you can say, you know, we're going to spread democracy. You've got to answer well, what do we do? You know, if we, you know, we take out the strongman dictator, beat their military, and force them to have elections, you know, Iraq style, right? Does that actually work? And I think a big part of what we've seen in um, Africa and the Middle East is that it doesn't actually work. If you take out the guy and just say, okay, you're having elections now, often, a, you know, there's a power vacuum, a new strongman steps in. I mean, Egypt, they, it even looked like it was going to work in Egypt, you know, they had, uh, what, a president for two years, a year and a half? And yes, then, but but he was he was a president of the Muslim Brotherhood. Absolutely. So, so and and that's the thing. So if people are, are used to authoritarianism, then they'll probably vote for an authoritarian. Uh, and you not could to say, mention the authoritarian is strong before usually before the election. You know? Right. Um, so they're they're in the public eye and people support them. I mean, Frank Bainimarama got elected mm -hmm. in uh, in Fiji. In Fiji. Um, that's right. So. Like you know, full full democ you know democracy, but suddenly you, you've got the the same guy. You know? Yes, and, and I suppose technically, some people might say, well, that's democracy. Mm. I mean, you know, Hitler technically was elected as well. Um, so, but the, and this is what, another point that Popper made, that makes that, that we raised in this in this article is that democracy is vulnerable to its own institutions because it can vote itself out of existence. So people can vote in somebody who then abolishes elections, as, as Hitler did in, in, um, in Germany. So, yes, it's more than its institutions. If it's not underpinned by the right cultural values, it won't survive and it won't be free anyway. Uh, it'll, it'll just be another form of authoritarianism. Mm. And we're always got to fight that. And, and that, again, is where free speech comes in. So if the population, the voting population, doesn't value the free expression of ideas, then democracy is in real trouble. And I think that's probably the central point I, I'm making. I, I'm not so much arguing what should be or what other people should do, because I believe that I'm responsible for upholding my values. And I can argue for those values and hope that other people think they're a good idea and think that the way that I conduct myself is worth emulating and try to be that person who, who 
is worth emulating in, my, in all of my weakness and, and with all of my flaws and so on as, as human beings have. Uh, I, I'm sceptical of the idea that these problems are so, ever solved politically. I, I, I think they're solved person by person, psychologically, <laughs> if at all. Mm. I mean, yeah, because that's, that's an interesting idea. As a, as a psychologist, um, it's interesting that you uh, are not in support of like large-scale political uh, change, you know. Where, where like, I'm sceptical of it. I'm, yeah. I'm not saying it never works or, you know, people ought not work to, towards that if they, if they see that as a good objective. But to me, it's not, it's not the way we solve the big problems. To me, it's... In, in a way, I think, I think politics and laws and so on follow rather than lead. Uh, cultural change yeah and I mean that's an interesting because when we come back to sort of um, you know the free speech thing right we were talking about um, you know how because uh, Jacob was saying that pe you know people in power are now so often or not often but sometimes anti-free speech and no one seems to have that big of a problem with that and, you know and it's it's interesting the cause and effect relationship is it that say Phil, you know Phil Goff who barred um, you mm -hmm. know Stefan Molyneux and Lawrence Southern, Southern yeah. from speaking is it that Phil Goff got into a position of power right it does, doesn't like free speech, and it just happened that way. And now other people are supporting him. Or is it the other way around? Is that in general there's a bit of an anti-free speech movement? People don't want to hear him speak, and then someone like Phil Goff comes into power. You know, or are they? Or does Phil Goff just happen to be one of them? You know, yeah. and it's and it's like a sort of a give and take relationship. You know, yeah. Because um, I, I think the idea of causality there is really interesting. Because if you understand the causality, you can understand how to break that causal link. You know, because if you think, okay, we just need to stop authoritarians from getting into power. You know, then that's what you can work for, right? But if you realize that that's going to happen unless you stop authoritarian attitudes from developing, you know, at the grassroots level, then yes. that totally affects what you have to do, uh, you know, to prevent that from happening. Yeah, you know? that's right. And I have no idea what, what Phil Goff's motivations for that were. Um, we could see him as a cynical politician. We could see him as a, a true believer that these people needed to be shut down or, or some, something in between. I, I, I don't know. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I, I think that um, that understanding of politicians is really interesting because it's very, very hard to know when, um, when you know, cynical politics involves like I will get X amount of votes, you know, if I do this, I'll get X amount of support, maybe X amount of donations, even even in New Zealand that happens, yeah. or whether it's the other way around where it's it's actually someone who even if you is actually ideologically driven, you know, they actually believe what they're doing, you know. And Jake, when I, we, we had this discussion, um, you know, uh, right before we came, where we would, you know, we're like. Is it that politicians are, like what percentage of anti free speech people actually believe? You know, like if you're on Twitter, you know, like, this guy must be cancelled, you know, you know, ban his Twitter account, um, you know, arrest him. What percentage of those people actually believe that that, you know, they're like, you know, this guy cannot speak, it'll be bad for everyone. What percentage of them are just virtue signaling? Mm. And what percentage of them are like, you know, it's very cynical, you know, it's like they're you know, politician they, they want they want to gain something out of out of that perspective. And I think if yeah. you understand those ratios, then you can understand how to attack the problem a lot more. Yeah, you, you might be right. I, I'd ask another question, though, that might come before any of those, which is how many of them actually would be able to answer those questions about themselves? How many of them have actually thought about it enough to know whether they're just virtue signaling or whether they really believe this? And if they do really believe it, then why? And and have they thought through the implications of what they're saying? And so I think there's an awful lot of herd behaviour that goes on. We can call that virtue, virtue signalling. We can, we can call it conformity. It is definitely conformity. It's, it's, it's a way that human beings are. We, we tend to want to be liked by others, and so we emulate other people's behaviour and, and try to fit in and, and so on. And, and if you're in a social media environment and a, and a, and a thing like Twitter, which I, I'm not, but I've observed enough of to know is it gets pretty toxic, gets pretty, you know, vicious. Uh, well, no one wants to be mobbed. Uh, and so a lot of people will just toe the line out of fear, perhaps fear of being mobbed. That's a, a powerful motivation. Uh, some people may really believe that these people are dangerous and need to be banned. And yeah. So if these people necessarily haven't questioned themselves on their beliefs or the ideas that they hold, and they shout down anyone who tries to debate them on the topic. They've essentially created a, a safe space, an echo chamber. Mm. So how would you effectively, because you want to enact social change mm. to result in a better democracy or a better <laughs> country for everyone to live in. So, <laughs> the question is, how would you necessarily enact that social change when you've already got a 
sort of bubble around them to prevent them from actually enacting, enacting that change. So you mm. can't really penetrate into that, can you? Well, well, no, you can't. I, I mean, I, I don't go anywhere near t- Twitter or, or any other social media platform, and I don't think that there's much I, I can do about the, the existence of those echo chambers. They're, they're there and they do what they do. It's my hope that they'll eventually implode. And, and But again, you know, it comes back to having conversations like this one, to, to talking to people, especially young people, because, you know, you guys have got many decades ahead of you and, and in 20 years you'll be, you know, leaders in your various fields. And, and that's when <laughs> all of the things that you're learning now will have a chance to be expressed on a, on a, on a larger platform. And, and so education is the, is the key. Um, but it's not just formal education. It's, it's, you know, educating ourselves in an ongoing way. So this is, these conversations are always educative for me. You guys have already said things that have made me think and question myself. And that is, to me, the way ahead. It's, again, personal responsibility. We, there's no other way, in my view. You know, what, what are you going to do about Twitter? Mm. It's, it, it's a monolith. It's this great big thing. We, it's not going anywhere fast. So, As an educational psychologist, though, would you say that the schooling system could prepare people better for entering that monolith? Because there's no way, as you say, there's nothing you're going to be able to do about Twitter, right? And there's no way even that you'd be able to stop people from going on Twitter. But do you think that the, you know, the public education system could give people the tools to deal with being on Twitter more effectively, yes, or, or other social media in general, um, yep, Twitter being a specific example. I do, and I, and I think the way in which it, it could do that best is by systematically and carefully, over time, exposing people to ideas that are difficult, and so they get used to them. I mean, it's Jonathan Haidt's principle again. Rather than being too scared to go there, we gradually introduce people to, to these contra- controversies and teach them to argue properly and teach them to argue respectfully. Um, I mean, that, that to me is a really important one. So, you know, you mentioned before the, this problem that people will assume that you agree with vicious trolls if you defend their right to, to speak. Um, well, of course, I don't agree with them, and I don't, neither, especially don't agree with the way they go about things, like using offensive language, insulting people, using kind of empty rhetoric, it, all of these, the, all of the logical fallacies, you know, those are things that people ought to learn at school. Legitimate and illegitimate ways of making an argument. Yeah, uh, have you ever um, played fallacy bingo? <laughs> no. You, you take, a, you know, you find you something, you know, that's ridiculous, you know, from a troll or something, and you get on your other screen, you know, the list of logical fallacies, and right. you just, you know, you, and you just, as you, t- you tick them off as, as you go down the list. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, and honestly, that's something you, that, that could be taught in schools, you know, like yes. a year four class, you, you know, show them this list of logical fallacies, yes. then you show them some, you know, some quackery, like, uh, you know, Ken Ring, who thinks you can predict earthquakes, yep. right? And you put them together, and you say, okay you know, tell us, you know, point out the fallacies here. And then maybe 10 years later when they're on Twitter and somebody's, you know, trying to convince them that, you know, the Holocaust didn't happen or something, then, you know, that knowledge comes back um, helpful. Because yes. I was at school, you know, recently, you know, I'm, I'm only a second year at uni, and, you know, they're always, you know, critical thinking, put on your critical thinking cap, you know, but they mm. never actually teach you what that means, you know. Right. But, and, and not just that, they may tell you tell what it means. Like, critical thinking is like thinking about, you know, what you're, you know, what, what's being told to you. And it's like, okay, but you never actually are given any tools, unless you go out and find them, you know, if that's something you're interested in, which I happen to be, but unless you go out and find them, you're not actually given, you know, the toolkit to actually understand, you know, when you're being, you know, lied to or deceived or manipulated or, and it also goes the other way around. You don't know if you're, you know, if I'm arguing with someone, I'm wrong, but I'm a better arguer, right? And they don't, you know, they don't notice yep. my fallacies, right? Yep. Then suddenly I haven't, I think, okay, you know, that guy, I can, you know, I convinced that guy or, you know, I argue that guy, so I must be right. But it's not true at all. But you know, you're not given the tools to know whether that's the case. That's a really nice point as well. The 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 the, the point that being articulate is not the same thing as being right, uh, and and that and that's a, that's an arrogance that I have to guard against because I'm pretty articulate, and and so if I can argue people down, that doesn't make me right. Uh, yeah, and, absolutely. And, and that's a really important point to bear in mind. And and I think again, you know, going back to the education system. To have people examine their own ideas rigorously is, is the start of it. Um, so where are the flaws in my own thinking? It's that Popperian idea of falsification again. Like, what's wrong with this idea that I've had that I'm so attached to and that I really like? 
well, maybe it's a bad idea. Why, why might it be a bad idea? What, what could be the bad implications of it? Or, you know, where might be, where are my, my logical fallacies? And, and if I get used to doing that, well, my thinking is going to be better. And then when I start to go out and talk to other people, and they've done the same thing, the whole conversation will be better. And we won't take it personally when you say, oh, that's a reductio ad absurdum, or that, you know, oh, so it is, well spotted, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, because I, I think that if you, and yeah, if you learn early that being, you know, um, proved wrong is not actually a bad thing, it's actually because I mean, like psychology. I mean, I mean, you you would know as a psychologist, like you know, it, it feels really really bad to be proved wrong, you know, mm. or um, you know, or to or even to realize you're wrong, you know, um, but if you can ex expose people to that early and teach them that it's not actually a bad thing, you know, the bad thing is knowing you're wrong and then refusing to admit it, or you know, covering up in your mind that you're wrong. You know, yeah. I'm, I must deceiving be right. yourself. Exactly, yeah. and that happens. And that happens a lot. There's a lot of oh, um, yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of ideas where people, you know, even they deceive themselves. You know, more than anyone else can, you know, deceive them if you become too attached to an idea. So here's a question: Why is it so unpleasant to be proven wrong? What you know? Why, why do we hate it so much? And and maybe if we can understand the answer to that question, that that's a key to actually developing the ability to. Take it in good part. Well, it's interesting. I um, I was listening to uh, an audiobook, uh, "Think Like a Freak," from the guys who wrote Freak and Oh yes, yeah. <laughs> and they one they posited uh, a theory, although you know they're economists, so maybe we shouldn't listen to it too much. But their idea was that um, you know, once you you question one thing about yourself and you find it's wrong, even if it's just something small, you know, like you turns out you thought one diet was good, turns out that's wrong, right? The idea is that it, it for, it's like a you keep falling down this hole. We're like, okay, well, if this is wrong, what else? have I believed is wrong and if, if, as you keep going down and down like and you keep just proving ideas about yourself eventually you get to your own like personality you know like what about who I am is wrong and then you, you start to become very intimidated by that that's right and the easiest way to avoid that is to never start it in the first place and just never admit you were wrong in the first place and then you never fall down the you know the rabbit hole of self-questioning and yeah I, th I think you're fully onto something and, and and of course the deeper the belief the more it's seems to be part of one's identity or part of who one is and of course that's a terribly threatening thing to have challenged which is why people get most upset about religious disagreements political disagreements and the like that's that's where people's identities start to be threatened so yep I think there's a lot in that and, and again it takes practice to get used to being in the situation when we we, we are challenged in those kinds of ways and you can do it in a way that it doesn't feel threatening. Mm. Yeah, and I think that's also it's it's something that can, it can have very great effects at a social level because I mean, how many times have you heard someone say something that you know is wrong, right, or or you believe to be wrong? You know, either way, it doesn't really matter. And then, but you don't actually want to say anything about it because it's just not worth it socially because you know you know it's just going to turn into a shouted match or an argument or. Um, it's just going to, you know, sour your relationship with that person, you know, mm -hmm. like you're, you're at your, yeah, your in-laws place and, you know, they're, they're giving you a, uh, you know, their, their margarine, they're like, margarine is healthier than butter. And you're just like, and whether that's true or not is actually irrelevant, right? Yeah. But if you believe it's not true and you don't say anything because, you know, you're expecting social ostracization for saying something, that is actually a problem. Um, and in that situation, maybe, you know, it's a small deal. I mean, it's just margarine, who cares? But that idea in your head that, you know, you shouldn't challenge stuff because, you know, it'll lead to social problems could all be reversed if challenging stuff was actually viewed positively and people having their minds changed was actually viewed positively rather than negatively. That's right. And I, and I do think it's, it's reasonable to have that response sometimes, to say, well, actually, it's not worth challenging that because it's not going to go anywhere. It's just going to turn into a conflict. So what, you've got to choose your time and place, in other words. And, and also to, to practice and learn techniques of having difficult conversations that, are, um, that do go somewhere instead of just ending up in, a, in an impasse of people, you know, fundamentally disagreeing and not being willing to talk to one another anymore because they, they've both taken it too personally or whatever. Yeah, I do. Can you name any of those tools? Like, or, like do you have any advice for people uh, in that case if they want to have productive Well, I, I do think that, you know, what we were talking about before, st studying the structure of a, of a well-formed argument and, and what logical fallacies are and, and what constitutes a legitimate argument because that turns it into... You know, like a game of fallacy bingo, it's a game. It's like, okay, let's play this game. And it's a serious game in a way because we're talking about things that matter and, and we want to get to something real and something productive and something right. Um, but we're not making it 
you know, deeply important to our, our, our own identity to, to be right. In fact, maybe we can even adopt as our identity the constant revision of our points of view. Who I am as somebody who constantly revises my point of view. That would be a good way to be. Yeah, I would like absolutely. to be that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if, if you could form your identity around the fact that your identity is not challenged. <laughs> um, yeah. That would ironically and it's, be... And it's tremendously difficult, and it's the work of a lifetime. And, and yes, it needs to start young. Yeah. Although, perhaps you could make the argument that if it started young, it would be no work at all, because... Maybe. Um, yeah. Because it's interesting, is that... Do you think that that idea, you know, of like, you know, socially be, being proved wrong feels so bad, do you think that's a learnt behaviour or an inherent... I don't know. I, I do think that people are pretty inherently tribal, so they'll tend to band together with people who think the same sort of thoughts, sorts of things as them. Uh, I think there's a, a sort of competitive element a lot of the time, and people want to win. I think that wanting to win is pretty inherent, probably. I mean, you know, there are some some good things about human nature and some some pretty ugly things about human nature. <laughs> And I, so I don't, I don't think that it's a natural way to be at all, to, to argue well and to, and to argue in good faith and to enjoy being proven wrong or anything like that. I, I think it has to be learned, yeah, probably. And it's not easy to learn. So we're talking about an individu individualistic society that incentivizes good debates and critical thinking. Mm. So to link this back to what we were previously talking about, about social change how that is generally more preferable to political change. When you've got a society that is collectivistic and not open to critical thought in, as, as much as Western countries, and it's more concerned with collectivistic, you know, same thing, you know, you want to stay with the uh, majority, that sort of thought process, how would you, as a Western nation or an individual, attempt to cause social change mm. in a system such as that so you could actually like bring democracy to other nations that might be more autocratic well I guess first of all I wouldn't be too too sort of triumphant about my own culture in that regard I, I think you're right that Western societies have developed this marvellous idea of the sovereignty of the individual and, and I fully believe in that but that doesn't mean we're great at it <laughs> and that we're not susceptible to all of those more collectivist traps of, of um, peer group conformity and obedience to authority. We, we are very susceptible to those things, which is why we're still having this debate now and what, why these problems seem to be undergoing a resurgence. Uh, next, I'm not sure that you can set out to change another society. I <laughs> I don't know how one would do that. Uh, again, I, I'd come back to my own responsibility. You know, I, I, I very much like Jordan Peterson's admonition to put your house in perfect order. That that seems to me right. That actually, it almost starts and almost finishes with yourself. If you constantly work on yourself, then that may be the very best thing you can ever do. And, and then... Perhaps it emanates out, perhaps mm. through the way you conduct yourself in the world as a result of that self-examination, you encourage others to do the same, and then they encourage others to do the same, and, and people discover that that's a powerful way to be, and in that way the, the, the culture grows. And, and that's a sort of humility as well, because it's saying, well, I'm actually pretty limited as, a, as an individual, I'm only one person. I'm also incredibly important as an individual, as every other individual is, because I'm my own little world, I'm my, my own experience of life, and, and, and that's where the idea of political authority has its roots, I think. It's that, it's that Greek idea of logos, that, that, you know, there's a spark of something in each of us that is divine, that is a miracle, and I think it, it is, and it's why I, I, I can't be a scientific materialist despite being a scientist. It, it's, it's not, it doesn't explain everything because this, this, there's this logos this, and, and, and there's mythos as well and these, these, these things that are not captured by materialist doctrines. Um, so those things to me are the, the basis of the sovereignty of the individual 
and if we act from that place, then perhaps we can be effective and we can influence mm. things in the direction that seems to be beneficial. Uh, but I don't think that it's given to us to be able to make large-scale change where we can say, yes, I, I'm responsible for changing this thing and, and I'm the hero here or, or something like that. It, that that's a, possibly a form of arrogance to say mm. that it's my job to set out to change this authoritarian collectivist society so that it's more individualist and so on. Uh, even my own society, uh, very limited influence on. Now the question can actually be asked in inverse. How do we protect our own system, which you already described as vulnerable mm. to it, itself, its, its core values? How, how would you protect your own system from possible external influence with values that are antithetical to our own democracy? I think the answer is the same. By, by doing this, this self-examination, by, by making sure that we're constantly refining and winnowing our own ideas, our own ways of being, our own ways of interacting, so that the values that we see as being the path to that emancipation for, for society are values that we live in our interactions with one another. And when they are, it creates a certain sense of, well, well what? What's that sense that you have? I mean, I'm, I'm experiencing it now in this conversation. This is, it, it's the right conversation to have. It's, it, you know, it feels great. It's like, yeah, we're doing thing, something good here. And, and we're going to put it out there and maybe people will listen to it and think, yeah, I'd like to have a conversation like that too. Or I'd like to be able to think in this way. And what do I have to do to be able to? And, and then we're handing the, the ball to them to, to play for themselves rather than saying, here's how you should be. So. Would you not say, though, that that's almost a, uh, like a very, opti very, very optimistic view of human nature? Is the idea that, um, that like by being a role model to others, they will take, you know, take your ideas. Or the reverse, which is that by being a role model to others, other people's ideas inferior ideas won't spread because would you not say that in, in history overall mm. the big movers and shakers of history have been people who have very deliberately and very radically spread their ideas rather than those who just happen to be um, like there's some people who led by example you know um, who, who, who are we talking about give me an example so I would say so, so people who have made like really drastic changes in history you know you take um, you know take uh, Marx for example right who, mm -hmm. I mean, we, I think all of us at this table disagree with these changes, but, you know, he made some huge impacts in history. And he was very big on spreading his ideas. You know, that's, you know, all he did was, you know, try and, he wrote something and he wanted everyone to know about it, you know? Yeah. Um, and, you know, it worked. And, or Hitler, you know, he, he wrote something, you know, <laughs> had an ideology, and he, you know, he spent his life's work, arguably, was spreading that ideology to mm -hmm. everyone, right? And it yeah. worked yeah. overall. It yeah. was a huge change. So would you not say that um, the idea of, simply trying to, and it's an admirable idea, but I, I would argue it's a slightly uh, overly optimistic view of human nature that that's going to change people. Fair, fair point. I, I, I'm not very optimistic. Um, it, it's not so much a matter of optimism as, as perhaps a certain humility. It's like, well, what's the best I can hope for? And maybe it's the best I can hope for, rather than... Um, saying, I think I'm very likely to succeed in my own right. And that's why, to me, although to me the individual is sovereign, the individual is, is nothing on his or her own. We, we've got to work together with people who share our values and, and talk to them. And So I don't think any one person very often gets to make those kinds of changes. And I know that both of the people you mentioned made what I would consider pretty awful changes to the world. And, and so... Who, who has made some better ones? Well, you know, maybe we could light on Jesus and Buddha, for example, as, as, as people who have had arguably beneficial effects. I mean, people can argue about whether they're, they're institu the institutionalizations of the, the religions that were founded in most people's name have been beneficial or not. But I think that I would hold both of those people as being pretty transcendent, as, as, as having founded something that can be used very beneficially. Um, and I would also argue that neither of them really set out to proselytise their ideas very far. They had each a group of disciples who, who voluntarily associated with them because they enjoyed and got value out of what 
what they were saying and doing and, and then handed that on themselves and eventually those ideas caught on and, and yeah, they, they morphed and changed and became institutionalised and all the rest of it. But that, that's an example of starting very small and in neither of their lifetimes did the, the ideas that they were promulgating go very far. Uh, so I'm not sure that it's always, you know, the movers and shakers who, who are most influential. It, is it, I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, it's, that's, that's an idea that's been debated in history classes for you know, hundreds, sure like hundreds of years. Where it's, a, yeah. it's that idea of, is it, is it people? Is, is it trends? Is it... You well, know, maybe some it, ideas are just waiting to be expressed yeah, in, in a cultural I, moment. Exactly. Are some, yeah. are some ideas just... I mean, for example, it, it goes back to what we were discussing earlier, where you were talking about how um, you know, it's been too long since we had you know, proper authoritarian regimes in the Western world, right? And so we've forgotten about it, right? It's an idea is, has, you know, for example, this, the idea of the reduction of freedom of speech, has it just been waiting around, you know, just waiting, you know, it's been, it's been years, you know, since, since we had that, right? Has it just been waiting around, you know, for its opportunity, you know, and here, yeah. here it's back, and no one likes freedom of speech again, right? Or has there been, like, a specific concerted effort by, you know, a small group of people to make that happen, you know? Mm. Um, and I would argue that it's actually a little bit of both, because I'd argue that there... Because people tend to take advantage of trends. For example, in this case, um, I mean, Jake and I discuss, have discussed this extensively, where it's that the, in the United States, you know, the Democratic Party, uh, at least a big faction of it, has decided to take this, you know, anti-free speech identity politics, you know, what you are allowed to say is based on who you are sort of idea, and roll with it because it's popular, because it's a trend. And now you've got a big, powerful group of people trying to take advantage of that and, you know, rolling the ball still further, you know, down the, down the yeah. road. Well, I think it's definitely true that individuals and sort of committed groups can take control of political parties and, and that sort of, that can be a, a path to social change, yes, and, and to, yep, so I'd agree. Yeah, and I, and I think I think the thing is that these political groups often, because, um, you know, say you have a trend that's already started, right, a political group can scare it, you know, with, like which way, does it go positive, does it go negative, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Because, for example, if, you know, uh, say we take this idea of like identity politics, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing or a, like in, in my opinion, it can, it can be a good thing. You know, it can be, you know, like this was, you know, this wrong was done to your group. Let's try and, you know, write that whilst keeping everybody level. You know, there's arguments to be made for that. But, or you could take it in a totally negative direction and which direction the big party takes it, you know, the mm. people, the people who are most viewed takes it, takes the entire movement a certain direction, I would argue. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so the, the leader's, you know, as, you know, the movers and shakers, like I said earlier, maybe they can't create movements, necessarily, um, uh, other than in a really long term, but they perhaps can direct them in a positive or negative direction. Yep, I think that's right. And maybe whether it goes in a positive or negative direction has to do with the, the state of the culture when an idea comes up. I mean, to go back to, to Marx and Hitler, well, where did their ideas take root? Well, Marx's ideas first took root in, in feudal Russia, that wasn't his objective. He, he wanted the, the, the proletariat of the, you know, the working class of countries like England and France to rise up and take power. Well, that isn't where it happened. Why? Maybe because in England and France the, there were already democratic institutions that, that were a bulwark against that kind of totalitarian thinking. Whereas in feudal Russia, well, the peasants got on board because they had bugger all to lose, didn't they? Yeah, <laughs> yeah what, what, what could be worse, you know? Yeah, well, yeah, maybe something was, but, but nonetheless. <laughs> they um, didn't know that they, yet. No, that's right. And they, they certainly were not free people. So, and likewise, China was a peasant country. So I, I think that's a, an area where Marx was probably radically wrong, was that it wasn't the proletariat so much as that his feudal peasant populations where his ideas would be most received and you know where people had pretty limited education where people certainly had no exposure to the idea of the sovereignty of the individual or anything like that um, and again Hitler rose to power well Germany in the 1930s 1920s interesting case because they had no history of institutional democracy of course they, they were federated in about 1870 from the principalities of what had been the Holy Roman Empire um, under Bismarck, and then they became Germany under the Kaiser. Um, so it was a monarchy, and a fairly absolute monarchy, I think, until the end of World War I. And then the Treaty of Versailles was obviously a very disruptive thing for Germany. It made them extremely economically poor, as the war had done. There were large numbers of returned servicemen coming back to very poor prospects, and you had a, a nascent democracy in the Weimar Republic, which 
I think stood no chance really um, because although you would probably have called Germany an enlightened an enlightenment culture at that point because it, it certainly had a, a lot of enlightenment philosophers and writers and so on associated with it it had no history of actual democracy and so the Weimar Republic didn't have deep roots and not only that it was it had existential threats from the get-go in the form of extremist communists and fascists fighting it out in the streets Berlin and, and it was the, the fascists who, who won. <laughs> yeah and I think because um, you're talking about earlier you made the point that you know democracy is one of the few political institutions that can you know delete itself you know yeah. vote itself out of existence and I think it's an int Germany is a very very interesting case study of that because in you because you mentioned you know you know fascists and communists fighting in the streets but ironically it wasn't just fighting in the streets you know Ger the Weimar Republic Parliament was you know almost hung right. you know um, you know, radical left, radical right, and then, you know, some people, you know, perhaps in the middle, but, you know, there's too many of those radical factions for anything so to actually... an unstable... Yeah, absolutely, yeah, like it was an unstable system. But an interesting question, though, is that was the Weimar Republic an inherently badly set up democracy, you know, where the institutions were just wrong, you know, like they hadn't been set up properly? Or was it necessarily that actually democracy is inherently just weak against, you know, this, like, you know, if two extremist poles form, is it possible to maintain even a well well designed democracy through that process, you know? Good questions. I'm not enough of a political historian to, to comment on either question with any authority. Uh, um, the only thing I'd say is that um, whether it was set up well or badly, the Weimar Republic was set up. It didn't grow in native soil, as it were. Um, on the other question, it seems to me likely that if a system is characterised by two extremes with, with very little in the middle, pretty obviously unstable, isn't it? I mean, at the very best, it's going to lurch from one extreme to another. And most of the time, it seems that is bound for disaster because if there's not enough common ground between the, the dominant forces in a parliament, say, it seems to be headed for civil war. I don't know. Yeah, but I guess to almost to, to bring it back to free speech, do you think that um, if you have two, you know, diametrically opposed groups, do you think that free speech is enough at that point or like because you know you mentioned civil war there like at what point do you think like how how far apart do people have to be or how close can they be where free speech is enough you know yeah. um well maybe maybe the common ground they have to have is that is that the free exchange of ideas without getting into physical violence is the principle on which you operate hmm. and maybe that's enough if you share that maybe you can disagree about a great deal else but if you if you if the, all the parties agree on that, that it is never legitimate to pick up a weapon uh, and that we're restricted to using words, then we can avoid the worst excesses and maybe find some common ground. <laughs> um, it's really interesting that you mentioned you know, picking up a weapon and, and violence and stuff, because one of the things we really want to discuss with you as a psychologist was this idea um, that a few groups have, but we notably what we were looking at is Antifa, where they, the idea is that speech is in of itself violence, you know, like the negative... You know, like, if I say something that offends you or that uh, you find, um, you know, it can actually, like, hurt you, you know, on a physical, like, psych or on a psychological level, right, which will perhaps have physical ramifications down the line. And so we wanted to get your perspective as a psychologist, is that, is there any legitimacy to the idea that, you know, speech can actually be harmful to people? And if there is legitimacy to that idea, how do we reconcile that with the fact that we want people to be able to speak freely? Mm. I think it goes back to developing anti-fragile people through education. So... It is definitely the case that, you know, what people say to one another can hurt one another's feelings. So that's not the same as violence, though. I absolutely draw a sharp distinction between hurting feelings and, and acting violently. You know, it is not the same to say something insulting as it is to punch someone or, or, or to use a weapon on someone. Uh, which is not to say that insulting them is good behaviour or, or that... It ought to be tolerated in all circumstances or, or, or anything like that. Uh, and, you know, to take social media as an example, again, I, I think, well, there's a dreadful toll on young people's lives and suicide, and, and it's possible that part of that is, is due to what happens on social media, that people, I mean, I think especially young women suffer terribly from having their reputations undermined on social media. It's a sort of traditional female form of bullying, that, that kind of attacking people's reputation. Uh, you know, young men tend to 
Attacking. punch one another or something. <laughs> they, they, they're kind of bullying is more overt. Uh, obviously, this is speaking in generalities and there are exceptions, but um, what we are seeing is, is a great deal of anxiety and depression in young people and young women in particular. Uh, we found that on this campus in a survey that we did a couple of years ago. We were asking first year students lots of questions, one of which how often they felt anxious or depressed and astonishing, like far, far more young women were saying that they did than young men. And, and so, so yes, it's possible that what people say can lead to that. And it's a real issue. But what's the solution? I don't think it is to say, well, you'll be arrested if you say something hurtful. Or, you know, it, I think it's, it's actually about helping people to become more resilient so that they're able to deal with it because it happens and also to model civility to actually to, to say to children and young people that that's not the way you conduct yourself and to model it as adults so if adults don't model civil behavior then why would young people emulate it um, but but no I reject the idea fundamentally that words are in and of themselves violence in the same sense, or can be violence in the same sense as as throwing punches or or, or stabbing people. Yeah, I think I think that's uh, I think I think that's quite a. It, it's although I would argue that the distinction is perhaps um, not necessarily as sharp as you make it out to be. In the sense that if if you can, on one hand, say okay, so speech leads to this specific, you know, leads to anxiety, leads to depression, mm. even at an extreme level, leads to suicide, right? So speech leads to these, you know, we can can lead, mm -hmm. if, it, if misused, can lead to these, you know, series of bad things, right? And then, you know, we put on the other hand, you know, violence leads to a series of bad things, right? You know, pain, um, suffering for the person receiving it. Then, would you not say that instead of it being a sharp distinction, it's more like a gradational thing, you know, where it's like the worst speech is perhaps analogous to the best violence, if you I think, I, I, hmm. or I, I think speech is tantamount to violence when it's a threat of violence. If I say, unless you do this, I'm going to do something violent to you, and it's a credible threat, like I'm bigger than you or I have a weapon, mm -hmm. well, that, that is tantamount to violence, because I'm coercing you to do something under threat of violence. It's not quite as bad as actually stabbing you, because I haven't injured your body, but it, it's definitely on that continuum. But I do draw a, start, a sharp distinction between just insulting somebody or saying something even cruel about someone and actually committing violence on them. Um, and the reason that I draw that distinction is not because I think that the, the former is acceptable, because I don't, um, but I think it's possible to learn to deal with it. You can't learn to deal with being stabbed. You can learn to deal with somebody saying mean things about you. It's not easy and it's not desirable that people say mean things, but it is possible to learn to deal with it. And that is a, a sharp distinction possibly worth making. Yeah, I mean, just to, to, you know, sort of play with devil's advocate and yeah. push you down the road a little bit, because I think this is a really important distinction. I think it's an argument that a lot of people make against free speech, so if we can, you know, mm -hmm. really nut it out. Yeah. But I would argue that if you're going to use the argument that, you know, you can learn to deal with, um, you know, with uh, free speech being misused, right? You know, you can learn to deal with being insulted or whatever. Um, would you not argue that you can also learn to deal with the least effective, you know, the least uh, bad types of violence, right? You can also learn to deal you with probably that. Can. I mean, if someone, yeah. walks, if someone walks up to you in the street and shoves you, you know, every That's day, fair right? Point. You you couldn't learn to deal with that. You wouldn't want to, and violence is bad. But you could technically learn to deal with it. So where yeah. I guess what I'm saying is that it's not really the most like sharp, sharp Maybe distinction. You're right. um, but if, so, if but if we can agree on that, you know, if, you know, it's you know, obviously, you know, we can probably agree that violence is worse, right? But I would argue that they're on a continuum. Mm -hmm. But if we agree that they are on a continuum, then does that have any implications for how we approach free speech? Um, like, do we think that you know, so say we agree that. Um, you know, shoving is here, and you know, yeah. insulting someone is here. Do we need to change any of our beliefs about how we, you know, how we support free speech? Okay, so, so maybe we need to look at what level that might need to play out on. So I would be against the idea that we make it illegal to insult one another. Not least because then you have to appoint some authority to decide what constitutes an insult, and that doesn't seem like a very good idea to me, um, especially if you hand that power to the state, because that'll get used politically pretty quickly. Um, so again, maybe it comes down to how we conduct ourselves and how we teach our children to behave and, and how we 
conduct ourselves in our institutions like universities and, and schools. You know, as I said at the outset, while I think that no idea ought to be off the table at a university for, for discussion, I think it's more than reasonable to have some rules about how you conduct the discourse. Um, and not attacking people personally is one of the things that I would, I would say is a perfectly reasonable rule to have. So we could say a university is in an intellectual sense like a boxing ring. It's not a street fight, right? You don't, it's not no holds barred. There are, there are rules about how you conduct the discourse. So, um, but, you know, and it's a, it's a fair question to ask, but w when we get to the legal sense, I get really nervous about the idea that we would ban things because then you're investing in the power with, with the political level of society to decide what is acceptable discourse. And I, I don't like where that heads. Mm. We've already got like um, a legal framework for this, like you said at the start of the uh, podcast. Yep. We've got libel laws, we've got slander yep. laws. Yep. And if you want to cause immense harm to someone, you wouldn't, through speech, you wouldn't necessarily just go, you're stupid, you're dumb. Mm. You'd try to socially disenfranchise them mm. by targeting the thoughts of other people in regards to you. And we've already got laws against that. Slander, libel, That's and, right. and blackmail is something you can use to hold against people yes. with social ramifications. That's already barred. So I feel like legally and also to a certain extent, ethically, we've already got a zeitgeist of speech being able to be used as a weapon but i think there's a there's a there's a dis, there's a distinct line in that case and it being socially targeted and there's a there's a line within those two things as well isn't there because a threat of violence or blackmail which is pretty similar to that um they're they're criminal acts slander and libel are civil matters where we can sue one another for that and that seems to me a good distinction right because the former really is like violence because it can have the same results as violence. I can coerce you, you know, I can force you to do something essentially because you're scared of, of my weapons um, or my threats. And legitimately so, because if I wasn't credible, you wouldn't be scared and you wouldn't respond to the threat. If I was a two year old who said, I'll, I'll beat you up if you don't, you know, as my daughter does. Um, <laughs> well, that that's not credible. So that. And legally, that wouldn't be seen as a, as a criminal threat. <laughs> you know, uh, Fortunately for your daughter. Yeah, yeah, right. Or even to adults. I mean, there's a legal distinction between, you know, a, a six foot four man threatening a five foot woman and the other way around. And so there should be, because unless the woman's got a gun in her hand, the, the threat is not credible, right? Whereas um, slander and libel and so on, that's, well, that's reputational and the redress is financial. It seems like a good distinction to me. Um, but then what would you, what are your opinions on cyberbullying legislation? Um, or even anti-bullying legislation in a more general sense, but I think cyberbullying is more, um, you know, culturally significant at the moment, right? Where you talk about how, you know, particularly girls are partic uh, feeling like anxious and, um, you know, uh, depressed at university. But also, do you think that if someone is being cyberbullied, right, technically, if, you know, no, there's no live or slander because no one else is involved. There's no blackmail and there's no, um, you, you know, there's no uh, threat to violence necessarily, mm. right? And yet that behaviour is causing to those, um, to the person receiving it, uh, harm as bad as violence, you could argue. In fact, it, sometimes it can even manifest in self-violence, you know, through cutting and suicide, right? Um, so are you in support of uh, cyberbullying legislation? And if so, um, you know, how do you well, reckon well, we get around? Well, I have to... Uh... What, what, what might this legislation say? Uh, well, see, that's, in, that's an interesting <laughs> idea. <laughs> that's what I put to you, is that so, if, so if you were to support it, what would it have to say that would make you feel comfortable that it's going to not be misused? Well, uh, first of all, who's running the platform? It's a private company, uh, presumably, so we could be talking Twitter or Facebook or something like that. Mm. They're private companies. Uh, I think private companies have a responsibility to act ethically. Uh, so they... Are comp they comprise individuals and the individuals make decisions and so the people who make decisions at Facebook and so on might take the view that we're going to ban people who engage in cy cyberbullying and maybe they'd get that right and maybe they wouldn't. If they're motivated by the sorts of values that I'm espousing and try to be motivated by myself 
then they would be careful not to ban people just for saying things that other people might find uncomfortable, like, you know, trans women aren't really women or something like that. That's not attacking an individual. The trans community and trans activists might say, well, they're still t attacking this category of people, and you could have that debate. So there's no sort of hard way to define this. I, I disagree with people being banned for those sorts of reasons, but in the end, Facebook is able to make its own decisions because it's a private entity. Uh, I would I would encourage them to ban people who just say nasty things about individuals for the sake of, of hurting them. I, I think that's a perfectly legitimate thing for Facebook to do. Again, though, if we were going to say, well, let's lock them up as well, then I'd get more nervous. <laughs> right, but... If, um, if, you know, the private companies are not acting that way, you know, because uh, private companies, you know, whilst we believe that they should hold themselves up to ethical standards, they mm -hmm. often hold themselves up to financial standards instead. And if, yes. and if um, you know, there's no financial motivation for them to do something, then they often won't. So if, for example, and we live in a world now where Facebook technically will ban people for cyberbullying in a more in a technical sense, but in reality it doesn't actually happen very often because, you know, you have to go for a reporting process. I mean, you know, someone at Facebook has to just, to, you know, check, and, you know, and then ban someone, right? So, but would you not say that there is a governmental responsibility to prevent that sort of um, harm coming to people? Um, and if you would say that, then um, you know what? Are, what do we do about it? Hmm. I'd have to. I have to think about that quite hard because there's, there there are competing risks. So, if we allowed the state to say to private companies, we require you to ban people under these circumstances. It might be possible to frame some re some legislation that was so well drafted that only people who were attacking individuals got banned. I would still worry about the downstream consequences of giving that power to the state. Yeah, absolutely. Well, ex I think with every single restriction on place on freedom of speech, which we all agree, you know, we sat around the table and agreed that there should be some, you know, mm. but I think with every single restriction, you know, you're weighing risk, you know, on the one hand, you've got, you know, protection of people, right? But on the other hand, you have protection of, you know, the, the people, uh, protection of the, you know, the value we support, mm. which in of itself protects people, you yeah. know? Um, and yeah. so I think that every single, you know, change you make to these, you know, really core values, you know, it's a you know you're weighing up. Yeah, that's right. And, and I guess you know, my philosophical position is very, it's quite libertarian. It's quite anti-authoritarian. Uh, those are the, the the values that seem to be built into me for whatever reason. They always have been. Um, so that's my perspective on it, and th and that's where I come from. So that's the lens that I, I bring to it. it. It doesn't mean that that's right, of course, and that and that. Yeah, I mean, I, I find it hard to argue from the authoritarian perspective. <laughs> um, but I, I, I can see, I can see the case for it. But it's still, you know, to me, the better approach, if we can do it, is to do it through example and education. So, and and also to point out and to help young people and to support them more and, and to make them more resilient, but also to well, keep them away from damn social media until they're a bit older and able to, a bit more resilient. I mean, Hyatt argues that no one should touch it till they're 16, and I, I strongly suspect he's right. Because, you, you know, that early adolescence phase, you're really, really vulnerable to your peer group, right? You care deeply what your peers think of you, much more than you will five or ten years later. Uh, I mean, everyone cares what their friends think of them and so on, but at that point you're defining your identity socially and it's a really vulnerable time. You, you subject to all the hormones of adolescence, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, maybe parents and schools and, and so on have some authority to, some, so, sorry, some responsibility to, to keep children away from those potentially harmful influences until they're old enough to cope with them and maybe to, to maybe we should have a, a more uh, thought through process for enculturating people I mean 
Social media is very new. It's, a, it's only been with us on a large scale for about a decade. And we haven't learned to use it yet. We haven't learned it really even how it works and, and what its social implications are. We're, we're just starting to find that out. And maybe we need to develop a, a culture of introducing people to it in a, in a, in a, in a better way. And maybe, you know, it, that could work as well or better than hard rules about what you're allowed to do or say. I mean, theoretically, we could be walking around in, you know, as it were, offline society, insulting people, you know, bullying one another, etc., in the, in the sorts of ways that seem to happen on Facebook and Twitter. But we don't, because we've got mores of social behaviour that prevent us from doing that. So you're saying we need to sort of develop a set of... So, so like, in, in real life, I have a social norm which stops me from walking over to Jacob and just, you know, insulting him. You yeah. Know, until he's, but, you know, are you saying that that sort of set of norms doesn't exist on social media yet? It doesn't seem to, does it? And maybe there's good reasons why it doesn't. I mean, one of your, your questions that you sent through to me was asking about that, you know, is it the, the impersonal nature of it that makes it like that? And it, and it probably is to an extent. I think when you don't know who you're talking to and and they don't know who you are, it makes it all too easy to say nasty stuff. But maybe there's a way to be with it that, where that becomes unacceptable and, and that, that those platforms could become more self-policing if, if, if the cultures on them started to reject that kind of behaviour. And maybe that would be a, a better way for things to be that, than just legislated. I mean, I mean, we could have legislation that, that said that if... if I say mean things to you, then I can be fined or, or banned from social interaction in public or something like that. That, that would seem draconian. Don't give the UK any ideas. <laughs> no, quite. <laughs> so, like, to me, it's not so much a matter of what's right and what's wrong. I mean, it, we can d definitely agree or debate what's ethical. But in terms of what to do, it seems to be more, more about where social values take us or, than... than you know, what the right response is, because these things are bigger than us in, in many ways. And, and I'm not sure that our instinct to want to control things is, is, is a good one to surrender to. But again, you know, that's coming from the perspective of somebody who is, this, for whatever reason, inbuilt distrust of authority and, and the state and is pretty libertarian in motivation. And so I can definitely understand other people feeling differently about that who have, have different value systems. So, and it, again, that's where it needs to be a, a civil contest of ideas to, to find out, well, do we need to do something? And if so, what? Rather than, you know, anyone really knowing the answer yet. And <laughs> mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was thinking of uh, ending the podcast here, unless anyone else has any... Um you know, anything they're burning we'd like to discuss or amend or, no, you know, that, that anything sounds... they're afraid of getting sound, sound bitten, you know, in, in a few years. That sounds good. And um, if we get sound bitten, so be it. Okay. We, we, we won't. We'll use we our freedom of speech we'll, to... We'll, uh... we'll be courageous in that respect. And, and, and thank you guys very much. Yeah, no worries. Thanks very much. Thanks for having us. <laughs>